Hoi hoi, hello and welcome to the Meet Maastricht podcast. I'm Katrina and together with our resident local Lucy, we will be exploring some of the amazing stories that make Maastricht so special. So sit back, relax and join us as we learn about our favourite Dutch city. Hello everyone, I just have a couple of quick messages before we jump back into part two of our Since of Us discussion. Number one, there was a small error in part one, which was that uh, the division of Protestants and Catholics did not date from the 19th century, but was already made in uh, 1632 when Frederick Hondrik conquered Maastricht for the Protestant Republic and it became the successor to the Dukes of Brabant. Okay. (laughs) Secondly, this will be our last podcast for 2020. It has been a ride. Thank you to everyone who has been listening to these podcasts. We really appreciate all your feedback. We love sharing our love of Maastricht with you. So we hope you all have a lovely Christmas holiday or whatever holiday you celebrate, a happy New Year's, and we will be back in 2021 with even more stories to share, some more guests for you, and hopefully, eventually, safely, some more events and tours and walks for you as well. Until then, enjoy this episode and we will see you in the new year. Hello everyone and welcome to episode 31 of the Meet Maastricht podcast. We hope you're all staying safe and warm as it cools down. I'm here with Lucy as always. How are you Lucy? Well, maybe uh, not not, uh, in accordance with uh, how how most of the experts will be feeling here, but I'm actually enjoying the cold. You know, (laughs) it is... is, in, in Dutch winters, uh, the cold is preferable to higher temperatures in winter yeah. because when it is warmer, it will be grey and rainy. But the colder it is, the higher the ah. chances of blue skies and sunshine. True. So. Yes, well, I'm a, I'm a cold weather person too, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So just bundle up and get out there. Yeah. <laughs> or don't, just stay in. <laughs> just, oh, just, yeah, and wear, okay, or wear a mask. <laughs> <laughs> whatever you like yes and we know what we're talking about today but for those who are who need a refresher what are we covering in today's episode yeah and also for those who start at the most recent episode of these podcasts and work work their way back then, <laughs> I mean those people exist too um, we are dealing with the uh, sense of Haas Basilica and you and I decided there was so much to talk about there that we uh, uh, had to uh, spread it over two podcasts. So we've we've done one where we've talked mainly about the people connected with that church. So everything that was going on there with the with the canons and with the pilgrims and with the French horses who had to stay there when uh, <laughs> the revolutionaries took over the city, and so the inhabitants, the visitors, and um, Today we will be talking about the building. Yes. And we could and we could easily fill five podcasts <laughs> with that as well. So we will we will not do that to you. There are plenty of publications about about the basilica and quite a bit of it in English as well. So you know, if you are yeah. deeply interested, there is uh, literature. Yeah, and it's also a space you can go to. So um, um, exactly, that is that you you're taking the words from my mouth, <laughs> and of course it might be much more interesting to just look uh just go there yeah and it's nice and accessible uh well at least from the outside to go to the Vratov and look at the sense of us basilica but and i'm sure you can look up the current regulations and everything for if you want to go inside as well yeah Uh, the church is open to visitors every day you can you can go into part of the um, the cloisters and mm -hmm. there is a there is a chapel for prayer which is uh, open every day if you want to see the rest of the cloisters and the church which i would highly recommend and the treasure room let's not forget the treasure room you pay a small fee but during 
the religious services, you can just attend church and and it will be it will be open to all yeah and i don't know if there's anything special going on for i imagine for christmas services and things but there might yes. be online yes. things as well as in person things um yes. going on so make yes. sure to check out their calendar i'm sure this is a busy yeah. time of year for <laughs> For yeah. Sense of us. yeah, the 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 advent has started yeah. the four week period preceding Christmas. So of course there will be uh, there will be uh, uh, celebrations of that leading up to Christmas, and the Christmas celebrations themselves are of course very elaborate and festive. But you know, since we are in this pandemic year, it will all be different now. But also because of this reason, RTV Maastricht uh, broadcasts these services. Okay. So, so you can you can follow them uh, live, and you can uh, retrieve them from the RTV Maastricht website as well, and watch them later. And like I said, very very elaborate traditional celebrations with all the pomp and circumstance that <laughs> goes along with that. Uh, lots of incense and yeah. singing. But the church has a magnificent choir, and they will um, so they will, and, and a very good organ. So the music will be. Terrific. Yeah, and you have sort of a unique opportunity as well to see that without av- actually having to go there. So yeah. it's a historic, yeah. historic uh, time, historic year. So um, it might be interesting for people if they're not in Maastricht or if they're yeah. um, not able to go to watch things as well. So how did it begin? How did this building begin? I know we talked a little bit about it last time. Um, did you want to start with the precursors to the is there much information I don't think there's much information about that if I remember rightly well there is lots of information but it is very difficult apparently to be very precise about all that (laughs) okay see what the main thing to remember about the building uh, you know which we of course will be uh, discussing uh, a bit more extensively in this podcast but the main thing to remember is that it has been a work in progress for 1700 years yeah so whatever there there was was constantly in flux people mm. have been adding people have been uh, leveling and rebuilding and extending and modifying and bringing it up to the taste of the times and then mm. turning back the clock demolishing other parts and adding new ones and it's imagine this 17 a building campaign of 1700 years yeah. and then the, the result of that is standing at the right of now if you've, if yeah. you've got a DIY project that you feel like people are bugging you that you've not finished, just just head them towards this podcast and be like, God, I've got 1,700 years. <laughs> At least. At least. <laughs> the earliest mention we have of, of anything built here mm-hmm. is, I think, from the, from the 6th century. So several centuries after the death of... Sylvas. Right. He was a, a missionary who brought Christian faith to these areas. He was the Bishop of Tonga and he came to Maastricht and died here and was buried alongside the Roman road outside of the Roman settlement. And it is on this spot that uh, at first there was a small construction supposedly of wood. Very soon there was a small wooden structure Mm. the size of what we would now consider a large grave monument about four by four meters, not much more than that. Uh, Then there was chapel, a church, and uh, a church on top of that and so on and so forth and now if you go to into into the uh, savas as it is today the oldest parts you can see are of course the parts that are underground so if you if you walk down the nave of the church towards the altar to the left and the right side of the altar there are stairs leading down into crypts and there is a succession of crypts under the present day floor of the church and the oldest ones are supposed to contain the grave of Sophas. Mm-hmm. there is no historical certainty about this okay. But tradition holds that this particular spot is the grave of Savas. Yes. The stone sarcophagus that is put in that space is definitely not from Savas's time, but mm. much later. And in the room before it, 
uh, in front of it, so the crypt in front of it, is where the last of the Carolingian dynasty found their grave. So the, when you when you go into the crypt and you look at the the the, the closed off cellars, mm. you can you can see through the ironwork of the door and the window. You can see first this big sarcophagus of a, of the last Carolingians. And then through another little window, the sarcophagus of supposedly Savas's grave. And this, of course, was the pilgrim's destination for centuries yes. and centuries. Okay. And you are standing then in a crypt which was uh, medieval, mm. which was filled in in the 19th century and dug up again in the Great Restoration campaign of the late 19th century. Okay. And uh, behind that, and then you have to go down another flight of stairs, is another crypt, and that is underneath the abscess. And the abscess is the, the round part between the towers that you can oh. see from the from the Vredov. Okay. And uh, the level of the Vredov in the course of the centuries has come up uh, uh, three to four meters. Oh, wow. Yeah, meaning that this very deep crypt, which is now completely underground, used to have daylight. So oh, it, okay. it did... It, it did have windows uh, in the in the 12th century, 10th, 12th century, when the when the abscess was built. Uh -huh. But now it doesn't now it doesn't anymore. And so you 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 come down these you you have to you have to be on a special tour to be able to mm. see this. This is this is not accessible to the public. When you go down there, you you really do have this feeling of uh, well, in any of these scripts, really, you you really do have a feeling of going back through the ages. Yeah. I have said this before on these podcasts. Of course, modern science and, and everything we are able to establish as facts uh, is, of course, one side of the story that you can tell about places like these. You know, even if uh, the crypt might not be in the right place and the sarcophagus might not be from the right period and yeah. some might even cast doubt on the existence of Savas himself, um, none of that detracts from the significance of that place. Uh, of course, when you when you are looking at 1,700 years of of a place being considered sacred uh, by many, but also as as uh, important in the sense of accumulation of of power and rights and property, uh, those are those are all layers of significance that yeah. are there, you know, and they are they are facts in their own. Right, quite, quite uh, apart from, uh, they don't need the justification of their origin story being factual. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, yeah. So, those crypts have been there since the, how, since when? Yeah, we have the we have the oldest mentions from, the, as I as I said, from from the sixth century, Gregorius yeah. from Tour. According to the timeline I have here, it is it is very difficult to date these two particular spaces. Okay. They they are traditionally considered the oldest pieces of the church still in existence, and that might you know that might still be that might still be true. But it's um, they are just not sure about where to date them exactly between the sixth to the ninth centuries. Of course, from our viewpoint, more than a, almost fifteen hundred years later, who cares? But <laughs> but of course, for for archaeologists and for historians, these are these are very uh, this is crucial information. Yeah. What adds to the confusion is that in the sequence of buildings that has been there, that have been there, there once was a period when there was a I think a six-sided. Anyway, a, a building that that was not did not have the shape of most church buildings, but that that was mm -hmm. uh, semi-round. So so uh, not not in the shape of a cross, but mm -hmm. more in the shape of a, that would have a, it would have had some sort of a domed ceiling. They've only found very few remains of that. You can still see them in the in the cellar beneath the treasure room, yeah. which used to be a chapel. And the, the crypts 
are cannot be connected. The situation of the crypts, so the place where they are in the in the present day church, cannot be connected with that much earlier church. So there is just and this is of course the type of the type of puzzles that archaeologists are forever yeah. having to, having to deal with. But it's um, so it's yeah like with so many things it's a bit of a mystery f from when they were. But the point at this time is that they are absolutely dead on the central axis of the existing church. Okay. And that church is in essence and has remained for a thousand years in essence a Romanesque building. Hmm. So what whatever the additions and the enlargements and the embellishments and the changes over a thousand years have been and like I said, you could write a, a series of books on this. <laughs> the essence of the building is still Romanesque. Yeah. And, and the way that the building is situated and centered and all its symbolic sites are lined up on an axis over the full length of the church, that has the, the crypts dead on that axis. Okay. So... So they they uh, they have, except for this this uh, uh, round building that has been there, the crypts have always been part of the of the building program of all the churches after it. Mm, yeah. Okay. And this is this is also a, a a central idea to keep in mind when, not just for the Savas, but for for buildings of this type of significance. Mm. Uh, wherever you find them, it is all the shapes and sizes and dimensions and measurements will carry significance. Yeah. And of course the way it ends up looking to us shows you what the building techniques and uh, the taste preferences of a particular period were. But what we as you know, the scientifically minded are generally not aware of is that all these all these spaces and the proportions of them mm. would carry um, a spiritual significance as well. Yeah, and you do have you do have a sense of that when you walk into a building like that. I mean, if you if you come into the Savas Basilica at the at the western side of the nave and you look from there down the length of the church towards the altar of course it's it, you know even if you don't know the first thing about what a church is and uh, how it was conceived and planned and built mm. you do get a sense of this being of significance and of walking down this nave towards the altar leads you to a place that is held in high regard and that apparently has a high significance you know yeah. anybody can anybody can sense that yeah well i mean even in i feel um churches are, are buildings that do that tend to do that very well um the like sort of having a very strong pull towards a focal point because even if you go to just a village church somewhere there'll be this you will know where you're supposed to be looking is yes <laughs> it's the point yes yeah yeah so that's and and that that is that is a science in a way yeah. that has that has evolved over hundreds of years as well, mm. and that is you know in the, and in a way that is that that is very interesting in itself. But of course, these 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 places offer you all sorts of information to look at and to ponder and 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 also to experience. Yeah. You know, I, I I hesitate to make to make the comparison to um, you know what we have. Well, we now call it, of course, of course, the arts and entertainment. You know, as in um, uh, symphony orchestras or movies or great dance productions or you know whatever it is. There is something there always appealing to the senses. Yeah. And. And and religious places do that too. Yeah. You know they 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 are aiming for an experience, and that's that's uh, and and that is probably also why we as human beings, like the human beings of 
a thousand years ago or two thousand years ago or ten thousand years ago. <laughs> we 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 still resonate with uh, our senses being appealed to, our emotions being appealed to. You know, yeah. quite 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 apart from the way the building looks. Yeah, and churches. I mean, and specifically, I think. Catholic churches are definitely very sort of sensual places where you have oh. the smells and the different looking things and the the and you can feel things and even just the feel of a bible or a hymnal or you know they they are very um very sense focused. <laughs> yes. The the Germans have a lovely word for this, Gesamtkunstwerk. Oh. And it means, uh, yeah, on the, and the Germans are the absolute world masters at at uh, 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 <laughs> making the longest possible words. So I, I <laughs> cannot say this in one word in English. English does not work like that. A Gesamtkunstwerk is a, a, a all-encompassing work of art. Mm. So, so it is an it is an artwork that contains everything and that is capable of appealing to everything. And yeah. and I, I and I think uh, uh, Catholic churches do a wonderful job at that. And then especially these extremely old ones. I mean, do realize and th and this is this is not a Maastrichtenaer being overly chauvinistic. Please do realize this was this was one of the main churches in. The uh, the Carolingian Empire, yeah, of around the year thousand, and in present day Europe, it is it is still uh, a church that belongs to the to the top tier of you know uh, build heritage that we that we still have, and the, the, you know it is it is in the in the in the Netherlands it is it is one of the most important monuments we have, yeah, and. Um, and when it comes to the treasure room, even with everything that has been has been stolen and and melted down uh, during the French Revolution, the treasure there is also among the most important in 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 Europe. Mm -hmm. And and as I said, far from far from uh, wanting to sound chauvinistic, <laughs> uh, I can I can assure you that most local people don't even realize this. Yeah. Yeah, so if you have a chance to go check it out while you're in Maastricht, <laughs> oh, do definitely do, <laughs> do, and then, and you know also it is it is such a wonderful thing to do in winter time, mm. you know because the church will be the church will be lit and and the treasure yeah. room just glows with the with the gold and the and the and the, you know and the beautiful stuff that is all there. But anyway, you know, this being a pandemic year and and everything being cancelled and restricted. But you know, get yourself in there. See <laughs> see 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 how that works and go and spend some time there. And if you and if you can manage that, manage it. Uh, join a service. Yeah. I would like to um, to address, like like I said, uh, from from the the fourth century on, when Saint Sylvain died here, there has been construction and reconstruction and restoration yeah. going on, and it's, um, you know, I, I think it will just be boring to go through uh, through that every step of the way. But I would like to concentrate or talk a little about the the last two great restoration campaigns. Mm. Because they, yeah. they, they they will feel a little closer to our kind of uh, uh, perception of the world, yeah. and so they are the most relevant to what the building looks like today. Okay. Okay. So that is the uh, that is the great restoration campaign of the the end of the 19th century, right. under the general direction of for for that period star architect as they are called now <laughs> Pierre Kuipers he yeah. was a he was a limburger so he w from uh, Roumont yeah, he, yeah. <laughs> No, not nice. <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah. Any, no, let's not get into that. Um, I just thought it in, was nice that they picked a local person. Yeah, but you know, you should know enough about the sensitivities around local by now to realize that for Maastricht, someone yeah. from Roermond was just. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like not that. Not quite as local. <laughs> no, 
no, not local enough, but still, you know, anyway, he was, at the time, he was considered uh, one of the, as I said, a star architect, as they call them these days, mm. as, as, as a, as a, uh, a very, a very, uh, he was, he was in high demand, let's, yeah. let's put it that, that way. And to me, that has that has always been a little surprising because his his main works are in Holland. He is the architect of the central station of Amsterdam, oh. and he and he is also the architect of the Rijksmuseum. So that is the main okay. museum of the kingdom in Amsterdam. <laughs> and this is surprising to me because his style, which we generally call uh, neo-Gothic. Mm. is extremely frilly, to put it disrespectfully. <laughs> it, yeah. is, it, it, it is all about decoration. Yeah. So, so turrets and tiles and, and, you know, all sorts of fluff. Mm. And, it's, you know, and of course, these, these buildings are fascinating to watch. You know, never a dull moment. Uh, yeah. Never one surface undecorated. <laughs> and it is, it, it is, to me... That is such a weird deviation from the general Holland inclination to mm. Protestant austerity. Yeah, was there a, was there a a move at the time towards more towards the more frilly, or was it just a, was it a strange choice even at the time? I'm not I'm not sure about that. So about mm. the last one. Yeah. But but I but, but I think the, the the end of the nineteenth century in in lots of ways had a, a, a feeling of uh, progress and development yeah. and uh, people making uh, humanity making great strides yes. and uh, it it might fit into that but it is you know it is something I have not researched it is just something I wonder about you know you get off the train in Amsterdam and you think what. <laughs> 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 and it and it and and it also and this is this is the political side of things. It also coincides with the period in which the Catholics were finally allowed to mm. show their faces again. Right. You know, ever ever since the uh, uh, the Low Countries became dominated by the Protestants as mm. of as of the 17th century. Yeah. Uh, Maastricht, as of 1632, when when uh, the prince of a prince of Orange uh, conquered the city, the the Catholics were forced to to keep a low profile. So processions were not allowed, and and uh, upkeep of churches was you know minimal, and uh, and then of course after that the the the, the great disaster of the of the uh, French revolutionary occupation. Yeah, when the church was abolished altogether and everything sold. Mm. Yeah, so maybe they just wanted to come back with a bang. They're yeah, just like we are coming back with all the bells and whistles. <laughs> yes, it is. There, there must have been a sense of that as as well, uh, tied up with all of this. But but anyway, it is. Uh, you know, we'll try and figure out sometime why the Protestants were were from from uh, the Delta were hiring. <laughs> <laughs> A gothic uh, lover from the south. Yeah. It is, you know, it is, it is sort of mysterious to me. But anyway, with this sense of style, uh, yeah. Goebbels was given the restoration of the Sauvage, mm. and what he had to work with was a was a building in a in a fairly dilapidated state. Right. That definitely needed uh, repairs and replacements. Uh, but he didn't stop at that. He had a program for how he thought the church should look. So he has uh, demolished things which he didn't think fit into the predominantly gothic character of the church and he added things. So for instance when you look at the west work it was now it has two towers Okay. That look Romanesque, and he thought, and between the two towers that look Romanesque, there was a at first a Baroque spire added to that, and then later on, all three of those towers were replaced with uh, a Rococo ensemble. Ooh. Yes, we, we, totally. I mean, we can't even imagine now that that was ever <laughs> there. 
So you know, in that sense, the the, the instinct of Kerpus to to demolish lots of later, more fashionable at the time editions mm. might have been the right instinct because now we look at the West work rising up from those massive, massive walls from the 10th century going up to the 12th century, and the, but the top of what we're looking at now is 19th century, and you don't realize that. No, I'm sure as as an architecture student, it probably would be a bit of a mess, and even just aesthetically might be a bit weird. But it would be so interesting if all of the random <laughs> things from in different styles were still there, because it would just be so. It would be like a sort of stratigraphy of like all the strata of a of a cliff, seeing all the towers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it is to to a large extent that is the case. Yeah, to a large extent that is the case, and 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 Kerpels respected that, but up to a point. Yeah, he he also he also put his stamp on the entire church in in the sense that um, he reconstructed it in the way that he preferred, and okay. that was the neo gothic. Yeah. And that is that that was most evident in um, the decorations on the interior of the church. So so he had it repainted from top to bottom with uh, iconography. 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 Thank you. So what should be there in terms of decorations and illustrations mm -hmm. and paintings of the saints and uh, the life of Christ and all of this has yeah. has a, a follows particular rules and is attempting to project a particular image and every age has done that so yeah. in that sense he is in an age old tradition but the point is that he chose the aesthetics of an earlier period of the gothic mm. and because it is not it is not a contemporary style at the uh, we call that a neo-Gothic. You have neo-Romanesque and neo-whatever. Any style can have a neo-version. Yes. And the neo-Gothic belongs to the, the, the 19th century. And uh, Pierre Kerpas was a master of it. Yeah. Ab the absolute apex of the, the, the architectural and the decorational uh, program of a, of a building, sort of imitating that style. Mm. Okay, then we get, then we get into the twentieth century, and of course, you know the, the way things go with buildings. Uh, Savage became yeah uh, a bit wonky here and there, and uh, <laughs> there were leaks here and there. And uh, anyway, a hundred years on, uh, another great restoration campaign was in order. We are in the nineteen eighties by now, mm. and the first thing they did, uh, thank heavens for that. <laughs> was sent in. Yes, well, you have to once in a while. If we are going to turn this humongous thing upside down, which has been there now for over 1500 years, the first thing we want to do is dig up the floor. Ooh. So you so you send in the archaeologists and you give them the time to explore, and they yeah. did. That 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 wound up that resulted in in series of photographs that just. <laughs> Made all of us gasp for breath. You know, <laughs> is this is this ever going to be right again? Yeah. You know, it, it looked horrible. That you know, the whole insides of the church to torn yeah. out and deep holes and yeah. scaffolding and oh my. Oh, I God. think there's a stage in every renovation where you're just like, oh no, it's been it's a terrible mistake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you've ever had a house, if you've ever lived in a house while it's being renovated, I'm sure you can remember that moment of, oh yeah. no. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So this is this is what Savas looked like. Imagine yeah. that on that scale. <laughs> so, oh gosh. But anyway, they they found lots of interesting stuff, and they took all the measurements of everything and photographed and documented. And and uh, I I think I've mentioned this before. So much of this material still needs to be published about. Mm. There is so much information still available, but not accessible. What what happened in the course of this restoration? was that some very, very tough decisions had to be made about what to restore and what yeah. to replace. And a decision was made to remove most of the Kuipers decorations. Okay. To remove most of the neo-Gothic additions in order to show again 
the original Gothic. Right. <laughs> this this became a national riot. Yeah. Raging debates, court cases all the way up to the highest court in the land. Bitter fights about, mm. you know, how many layers of paint to take off. Wow. Yeah. It has it has been high drama for a decade. Mm. I can tell you my personal experience and that will just have to do. <laughs> <laughs> because I am I am not I am not an expert who could, you know, take a valid position in this in this debate. But I can tell you my personal experience. And yeah. you know, from what I have said about how experiential these buildings are mm. Uh, that might carry a little validity. In the, uh, of course, as a as a as a child and a teenager, I have been to Sinsovas, and it was huge and dark and depressing to me. Mm, yeah. To me, overly decorated. I thought it was gaudy. I thought it was fake. You know, yeah. as I said, a neo style. Mm. And I was wondering what was underneath. Mm. Can you please take this away? And then in the 1980s they did. Yeah. And the way the church is now, with the much lighter ceiling, yeah. with the medieval decorations of that ceiling recreated, they are not original, they are recreated, mm. with the apsis restored back as far as they could to okay. not the earliest decorations that were there. They are irretrievably lost, but at least to the later Middle Age, me medieval ones that were there. Mm. The church feels like it can breathe again. Yeah. It is, it is light, it is festive, and it feels welcoming, and to me, it did not before. Yeah. So, but you know that, as I said, that's a personal opinion. You should all go and have a look. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll try and find some pictures of what it was like before. I don't know how many photographs there are, but assuming since they changed it in the eighties, that prior to that, there might be some photos. <laughs> yeah, there it's are. It's not so old that there are no photos. No. Of course, but it's you know it is and and these are these are interesting questions and that uh, and 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 of course a central one there is, you know when people have been have been working on this building and uh, changing it and adding to it and replacing mm. it completely, for century after century, then of course uh, uh, we in the in the twentieth century or we in the twenty first century also have every right i think to you know to add things or to change things yeah. or to add a contemporary touch because that of course also happened there were there were new things added a case in point being the gorgeous bronze doors on the vredhof yeah yeah those portals have been closed off for a long time and during this last restoration campaign the church was made accessible again from the Vredhof. And, you know, um, they thought it was in order to have beautiful doors put in there. And um, in, in our in our podcast about the, the Vogelstrauss, yes. you know, the, the cafe on the other side of the square, we told about how the money for these doors was raised by having a big party on the Vredhof organized by <laughs> people from the Vogelstrauss. So we get, you know, that's what Maastricht does. If you want to raise money, you have a party. And people will come and yeah. uh, have a bite to eat and have a drink. And uh, <laughs> yay presto, then the Savas has new bronze doors. <laughs> and I think it's so, like you said, it's it's as much as some some people probably disagree and and think that things should stay the same i always think especially something that has been is so old and has been added to and changed so many times it's not like you're preserving a beautiful sort of captured <laughs> crystal ball of something it's Thanks. it's been changed so many times that putting adding modern things i think just adds even even more layers to the history and to the yeah. story and makes it even more special yeah, um, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so too. You know, it 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 makes us also uh, uh, keepers of the heritage. Yeah, and uh, responsible for uh, handing it on to the generations after us uh, in good shape. 
and yeah. and with uh, some additions that we in our time think are significant. I mean, a very significant thing during that last restoration campaign, for instance, was <laughs> getting very mundane, is that they found that one of the stone supports of the church didn't have a foundation. Oh. So it was just sort of hanging on the wall oh, instead dear. of... Yeah, exactly. Instead of supporting the wall. Yeah, you don't want a support to be unsupported. <laughs> what? It's <laughs> a worry. So this this Paul action was was uh, causing a, a great a great tear in one of the walls, and uh, of course when they found mm. this, they they quickly corrected that and made sure that the wall was repaired and reinforced and that the support was supported. Yeah, <laughs> stuff like that, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but but at the at the same time, uh, and that is not visible. Uh, what is visible, of course, is the very contemporary style of those bronze doors. Yeah. And what is also visible is in the in the nave of the church, all the all the uh, the fake pillars on top of the real support pillars mm. have these have these little capitals, you know, the top of a pillar, and that's usually decorated. Okay. And usually these decorations will contain an entire program. Of uh, you know relevant stories, one of them now contains uh, the portraits of uh, the main building uh, team. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah, so there there is one there that in 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 the color and in the material it it fits with all the other ones that are centuries old. Mm. But this one that was made in the 1980s uh, shows you. A table with men <laughs> gathered around, and uh, uh, these are portraits of the of the of the architect and yeah. of the you know the main people concerned with this restoration campaign, and that yeah. also uh, uh, fits in a long tradition of men leaving their mark on the church, and yeah. also and also making that public. Yes. So the graves have been found of of former uh, uh, priors of the church, mm. uh, saying I, Bambertus, uh, was responsible for the great building campaign of uh, the <laughs> year thousand something. You know. Yeah. And, uh, so I think the, uh, the 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 builders, the restorers of the 1980s, were extremely understated by uh, just. <laughs> Just putting this little capital in the in the nave and leave it at that. Yeah, and it will, I mean it will help in the future. Or, I mean, obviously we have a lot more documentation now, uh, but in a thousand years, if architects are, <laughs> are hunting, and at least yeah. there'll be a stamp saying we made this, and this is who we are, and this is when we did it, and so they won't be hunting like they had to for the <laughs> yeah. for the other things. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully. Yes. But you know, as we've uh, as we've said before, it is it is possible to uh, to to go on for hours and hours and hours about this building. But it's you know it is it is it is more interesting, I think, really, to go and have a look at it. You know, go and have a look at 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 <laughs> all the statues in the in the great portal. Very very early Gothic. You know, the spectacular piece for for this country. Mm. And the uh, and the tiled floor in this uh, in this um, uh, portal, which uh, is a mosaic that was put in there centuries later, but it matches beautifully. And this mosaic on the floor allows you the possibility to uh, make pilgrimages to uh, all corners of Christianity. And of mm -hmm. course, the central the central pilgrimage is the one to Jerusalem. And to go and have a look at the majesty of the west work, you know, that was where the where the altar and the apsis, of course, are dedicated to the church, to religion. The west work is dedicated to temporal power. So that was mm. the place for the emperor. That's where his throne was. That was where his hall was. That was where the balustrade was, where he would watch the service. We have no 
dependable information he ever did. But I mean, <laughs> the building was <laughs> the, the building was there. It was ready and waiting for him if he ever yes, decided. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> no, but this is this is also beca because for for centuries this church was sort was treated as a sort of private property of the Carolingian rulers. Hmm. So, so you know, as as their their palace chapel to some extent, and they had several, of course, you know, because these were moving courts. They would travel around, yeah. and Savas was one of their churches. And then, of course, when it became more of a church belonging, being administered, being ruled by the canons, they they thought it was necessary to to keep this imperial connection, yeah, going. To keep the local rulers at bay, so Savas <laughs> until the until the, the the French Revolution was a state within a state. Yeah. And this and this is of course discussed in the in the other half of the podcast. But but you see that mentality, those ideas, you see them put into stone in the West work mm. on the on the inside. Yeah. So I think that is the that is the. The concluding idea of this entire of this entire podcast. Go visit. Go, go have a look. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. have a look with new eyes as you're listening to the podcast, <laughs> or once you've listened, because I'm sure the uh, it's always nice to hear about the stories of things that you might have seen a hundred times at least before. Because I know that I've walked past uh, Sins of Us <laughs> Basilica so many times, but. Now I will I will appreciate it more. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's I think that's the whole idea of these podcasts, <laughs> you know, appreciation. Yeah. yeah. Especially for something that people probably really have seen so many times because it is such a prominent building. Um and like we said last episode is it is on every top 10 list of things to do in Maastricht. <laughs> <laughs> to yeah. go see this church so if you live here and you've taken it for granted a little bit like I'm sure plenty of people have um, yeah. go, and, go and have a look and yeah. now's your chance <laughs> yeah and it's you know and the, the same goes for me you know that even even with with the the type of, of preferences that, that I have and the interest that I have in the in the city and its history, I also keep keep making new discoveries about about this church and its and its history. So you know, well, that just goes to show how <laughs> how interesting it is and how special it is. The gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this sounds awful. <laughs> anyway, before we before we descend into total um, flippery. <laughs> I th I think we will we will stick to the churches for a while and after oh. the yeah we, yeah that's what I'm saying now I don't know what I'll be yeah, saying yeah after next after week. another church you'll be like no <laughs> no exactly <laughs> but now that now that we've discussed the very old church I think next time we're going to discuss a much younger church mm -hmm. and it will force me to finally find the English word f which I could not think <laughs> of for this. <laughs> This earliest church that we um, that we found underneath the Savas, in Dutch it's called the Koepelkerk because oh. it is a church with a koepel or cupola. But oh. I have no idea how you would how you would call that in English. I don't know what is it. Well, church. <laughs> well, you said it's a church with something. What is the? Oh, thing uh, that oh, it's got? sorry, sorry, a, a cupola, yeah. and that is that is a dome. <gasps> oh. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. Good. We both have to go <laughs> and find the English word for this. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to the Meet Maastricht podcast. To keep up to date with all our content and events, make sure to follow us on social media. You can find us on Instagram at at Meet Maastricht and on Facebook at Come Meet Maastricht. If you love our podcast and would like to see some amazing archival images as you listen, don't forget to subscribe to the Meet Maastricht YouTube channel. If you love what we do and would like to support the Meet Maastricht team, you can also donate through PayPal via our website meetmaastricht.eu. 
Meet Maastricht is definitely a labour of love and all of the revenue we make through our tours and events currently goes towards administration costs. With your help, we would love to be able to give back a little something to the team so we can all keep bringing you our favourite stories and showing you our favourite places in Maastricht. Thanks again and tune in next time to learn more about our beautiful city. Tot ziens.